Can I use this one, actually? Is that okay? Great, thank you. Can you guys hear me? About, can you hear me? Oh, wait, okay, great. Um, I actually am running a little bit late this morning. Sorry, I had, a, I had a Bible study this morning. Praise the Lord. It was a real blessing. I don't know actually if my friend is watching right now, but if she is, very, very grateful for our study this morning and very grateful also for the opportunity to share what God has been teaching me. Um, this study was actually, or this sermon, message, Bible study was actually inspired by, thank you, Jonathan, inspired by the study I did with her last Sabbath. And, you know, she asked me some really great questions and I kind of started digging deeper and um, I think it's relevant to the time that we're living in now currently. So let's get straight into it. Let's say a word of prayer and dig into our Bibles. Our Father in heaven, we just want to thank you so much, Father, for your goodness and your mercy towards us and just for being, oh, just so amazing. We have no words, Father, and we're grateful to be able to worship you today on your holy Sabbath day in freedom in your house. And Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit will be on all of us, that you will help us to understand the words that we read and that your Holy Spirit will lead and guide us into all truth. I pray also that you will just put myself aside. Please humble me, Father, and help me to be open to your Spirit. Thank you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, due to my unpreparedness, Jonathan has been delivering things to me up here. I'm actually going to ask him also if he can bring me my backpack, which I left in the office there that has my sword, which is very, very important for this message. Uh, while he's doing that, I'm going to introduce you to... Is this working? I don't know where I should point it. Oh, yes, it's on... We'll see if we can progress it to the next one. There we go. Thank you. Does anybody know who these people are up here? Anybody seen this picture before? Thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, okay, so these people actually were part of an expedition in 1996. Does that ring any bells? And it was an expedition to Mount Everest. And in this expedition, there were, this is actually only one of the groups. There were three groups booked on that day to climb, to the, climb the summit. And the people who are circled, unfortunately, are the people who passed. And this is actually only four of the people who passed away. Out of the three groups, eight of them actually passed away. They were all seeking a mountaintop experience as, you know, there are many adventurous people in this world and they were seeking a mountaintop experience but they got caught in a storm in the wilderness and eight of them perished. And, you know, I want to take us to a wilderness experience in God's word that I believe is crucial for us, not just in the final, final end times that are coming quicker and quicker, it seems, every day as we read the news, but also for any wilderness experience that you're going through today. So if you want to open up in your Bibles, sorry, I don't know if I'm clicking to the wrong thing. If we can go over to the next slide. Thank you. So we're going to open up to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, and we're going to open to verses 16 and 17. Okay, Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. These will be very familiar verses to many of you, but if you're like me, I definitely needed a refresher. Okay, it says, And Jesus, when he was baptized, 
went up immediately out of the water and lo, the heavens were opened to him and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So many of you know these scenes. This is Christ's baptism, probably some of the most joyous scenes in the Bible. And we see here that God gives a specific message to his son. Let's, let's try and make this an interactive message today. What does God say to his son? Who does he tell him that he is? This is my beloved son. So in telling Jesus this, God is emphasizing to him, not only are you my son, because we know that Christ is the only begotten son of God, but you are my beloved son. And he very clearly tells him his identity in this verse. Now, this is really important because God does not allow Christ or does not lead Christ into a wilderness experience without first helping him know for sure what his identity is. Okay, so now let's continue reading in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now, when we think of the Holy Spirit... We don't often think that the Holy Spirit is going to lead us into temptation, right? Because we actually ask God, you know, when Christ prayed his um, prayer to God, to the Father, and he was giving us an example of what the model prayer should be, his prayer was, lead us not into temptation, right? So it's interesting that the Holy Spirit is actually leading Jesus into the wilderness. And it specifically says to be tempted by the devil. Now, it's important for us to have a look at God's people in the Old Testament and see their experience in the wilderness to understand why, why would the Holy Spirit lead Christ into the wilderness to be tempted. So let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 8, Deuteronomy chapter 8, and verse 2. Okay, and it says here, so this is speaking about the Israelites' 40-year wilderness experience. Those of you who don't know it or who want to know more about it, feel free to come up and ask later. It says in verse 2, and you shall remember all all the way which the Lord your God led you these 40 years in the wilderness. And here the reason is given why they were being led through the wilderness. It says, to humble you and to prove you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or no. So we can assume that Christ was being led for the same reasons as why the Holy Spirit was leading God's people in the wilderness. Christ was also needing, well, God was, you know, testing Christ to see would he keep the commandments that the Father had given him as well. So we see here very, very clear. Let's go back now to Matthew chapter 4 and let's keep reading in the story of the wilderness. Verses 2 to 3, it says, And when he had fasted, Jesus had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hungry. That makes sense. If you had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, I expect you would probably be hungry too. Has anyone fasted 40 days and 40 nights? Just checking. There are people out there who have fasted long times. Okay. So it says, he then sa- it then says, and when the tempter came to him, we know the tempter is Satan, he said, if you be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Whoo! So Christ is in the wilderness 40 days. He's been fasting this entire time. He clearly is hungry. And the first temptation that the devil gives is, is to turn these stones into bread. Now, I imagine if I was like Christ and I was in the wilderness 
and I had been fasting for 40 days and I looked at these stones, they would probably already look like bread to me. You know, you'd probably be looking at them going, oh, they, they kind of do look bread-like. It wouldn't be much just to ask the father, you know what, father, I'm really hungry. Just turn these into bread for me. You know, it, it wouldn't be that much, right? If I'm the son of God, I should be able to do that. Now, let's see what Jesus actually responds in verse 4. But he answered and said, and we know these words so well, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Christ is actually quoting from Scripture. And this is really important because when he's quoting from Scripture, he is quoting from a period when the Israelites were going through a very, very difficult experience. So let's go to Deuteronomy. Back to, so we're going back and forth. Keep your finger in Matthew chapter 4. We're going to go back to Deuteronomy, and we're going to read chapter 2, verses 3 to 4. The Israelites, man, we can learn a lot from them. We are so like them. Okay, chapter 2, verses 3 to 4. You know what? It's not actually. Chapter 8, same, same chapter that we were in before. Chapter 8, verses 3 to 4, it says, He humbled you and allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna which you knew not, neither did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread only, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord does man live. Your raiment waxed not old upon you, neither did your foot swell these 40 years. So we see here that what Christ is quoting from is a passage in Scripture that actually highlights a time when God provided for his people. And this is so crucial for us, especially with the times that are coming. And maybe you're in this situation now. Sometimes it can be very easy to actually, when we are praying to God, we actually will pray and be presumptuous in our prayer. We will claim his promises, but we will not fulfill the conditions of his promises. Because there are many promises in God's word that are actually conditional. I don't know if you realize that. They're conditional upon our obedience. And that's not to say that God doesn't bless us even when we are disobedient, because we, we only need to look at our own lives and at the lives of the Israelites to know that God can bless us even in our disobedience and in his mercy and grace, he does do that. But we also know that sometimes we can be presumptuous in the way we pray. Think about it this way. If you're going through a wilderness experience right now, there are so many people without jobs. 30% of Hawaii is experiencing unemployment because of the COVID-19 virus. And because of that, you may feel, it may, may not be you, but someone you know may feel that desperation. You know what? I'm getting to the point where I'm praying and praying for a job, for employment. I'm praying and praying. And the only places that will give me a job want me to work on the Sabbath, right? Maybe I should just pray, God, bless me as I work today, even on your Sabbath day. And, or maybe it's, maybe it's not that issue. Maybe it's to do with health. And you're asking God, God, heal me of this when there are all these health principles that you failed to follow along the way. That's what we call presumption. That's what we call claiming promises without fulfilling the conditions of those promises. And we see that that is not what Christ wants us to do. And that's not what he did. When he was tempted by the devil, when he was tempted to turn those stones into bread and to make food for himself, Christ said, you know what? I'm not going to do that because my father, my father provided for the Israelites when they wandered 40 years in the wilderness and he will provide for me. When it's, what it said here in Deuteronomy is, your raiment waxed not old upon you, neither did your foot swell these 40 years. You had clothes. You were eating the manna that I provided for you. God is telling us, do not give in to that temptation that, 
to believe that I won't provide for you. Because ultimately, that's what's happening when, when we're tempted. The devil is basically trying to get us to believe the lie that God will not do what he said he did, what he said he will do. And, and honestly, we're all guilty of, we, we all have different temptations. It could be, it could be an adulterous temptation. You know what? You're in a difficult marriage and all of a sudden someone starts messaging you who's really nice to you, who doesn't argue with you every day like your spouse does. And the temptation is to think, oh, maybe God is not blessing my marriage because it's not a union of God. No, when you marry someone, your union is of God. And so don't think that by, by exiting that and by disobeying God, that you can then claim those promises. God, now you're going to bless my new marriage. Will he bless your new marriage? As I said, God can and will bless us in our disobedience, but that is no reason for us to be disobedient. All right, let's, let's keep going. Um, I believe... Maybe I have my slides a little bit mixed up. Yes, I think I wanted to go back to Matthew chapter 4. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 4. And we're up to verses 5 and 6. I think I'm missing a slide in here. That's okay. Let's read verses 5 and 6. It says, Then the devil takes him up into the holy city and sets him on a pinnacle of the temple and says to him, If you be the Son of God, cast yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest at any time you dash your foot against a stone. So here we go. The devil sees, okay, Jesus is fighting me with scripture. Oh, well, maybe I should quote scripture to him, right? And this can happen for us even in our own experience. We are, we're, we're claiming scripture, we're, we're we're saying things a certain way. We're saying, okay, God, you said this in your word. And then this, this other voice will come into our heads and say, wait, but is that really what the word says? Right? That doesn't, that's, that's not, that couldn't be what the word says. Right? The same way God said to Eve, you can eat of every tree. I am the God of abundance. I want to bless you so abundantly. You can eat of every tree in the garden. But please, because I love you so much and because I want to be with you forever and I don't want to lose you, please, please, please do not eat of this one tree. But eat of every other tree. I want to bless you. And the devil says, wait, did God tell you you can't eat of every tree in the garden? And then when when Eve responds with what God actually said, the devil will downright lie. And this, is, this can be what happens in our experience. We will allow the devil to twist the word to justify our own desires and, our, and to allow us to follow our own feelings. And that's a big temptation. But let's have a look. Where is the devil actually quote, quoting from? Because... When the devil twists the word, he does it in a very, very subtle way. And it's important to know what we're up against. If we don't know our enemy, we shouldn't know him in an intimate way that, like we know God, but we should have an understanding of what kind of tactics he's going to use in our lives. So in Psalm 91, verses 9 to 14, it says this, Because you have made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, your habitation, there shall no evil befall you, neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you. That sounds like what, what the devil said to Christ in Matthew chapter 4, right? He shall, keep his, he shall give his angels charge over you. But this is the part that is missing from what he quotes in Matthew chapter 4. Here, he says, God says, to keep you in all your ways. 
They shall bear you up in their hands, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shall you trample under feet. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. So here, the emphasis is deliverance, right? The emphasis is the part that the devil leaves out is God will keep you in all your ways. The devil doesn't want Christ to think on that while he's tempting him. He doesn't want him to say, to to actually believe this promise. He wants to twist the word. And when we go back to Matthew chapter 4, I know we're flipping back and forth. When we go back to Matthew chapter 4, we see he's, he's using this scripture to say to God, to say to Christ, cast yourself down because the angels will do all these things. But he doesn't say the angels will actually keep you in your ways and deliver you from me, the devil, right? So we see again a twist of scripture. All right, Matthew chapter 4, verse 7. It says here, Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, Christ quotes scripture. Now, where does he actually quote from? This is from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 16. And to me, you know, it was really important to me to actually see where all these scriptures that are being thrown back and forth between the devil and between our Savior. Where where are these scriptures coming from? Why? What, what were they referring to? Because there's so much more meaning behind what they're saying than just the brief sentence that they're quoting. There's so much more meaning. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 16. It says here, You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massa. Okay, and then when we read the next couple of verses in Matthew chapter 4, we're going to go back to Deuteronomy that, that chapter as well. It says in verses 8 and 9, again, the devil takes him up into an exceeding high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and says to him, all these things will I give you if you will fall down and worship me. Now, this is an extremely daring and brave temptation because remember in verse 7, Jesus has just said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. He is asserting right now his divinity. He is saying, I am the son of God. I know because when I was baptized, my father sent his Holy Spirit down as a dove to tell me. His voice came from heaven and he said to me, this is my beloved son. He reminded me of my identity. So I'm telling you now, you cannot tempt me. You should not tempt me because I am the Lord your God. And then the devil after this still says to him, all these things will I give you if you will fall down and worship me. Now, and he he shows him, he takes him up into an exceeding high mountain. He gives him a mountaintop experience. And he shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. Now, At this point, was the devil the ruler of the world? At this point, when he's showing him the the kingdoms and all the glory, is he the ruler of the world? Think about it. When Job chapter 1, it says that there was a meeting, right, between all the rulers of the world. And the prince of this world attended that meeting. And the prince of this world was the devil. How do we actually know that the devil is the prince of this world? What what do we see that helps us to understand that the devil is the ruler of this world? What was that? Pride. That's right. We see pride in people and we see disobedience, right? Anytime we see disobedience, it's a sign that the devil still has a foot in. Any disobedience to God is from the devil because God God would never send or God would never send his Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit would never impress us to disobey God, right? 
So anytime we see that disobedience, that rebellion against God, we know 100%. We, we need to call sin by its right name. It is from the devil. And that may sound harsh. You may think to yourself, man, I've disobeyed God before. Was I being controlled by the devil? It sounds harsh, but if you're not being controlled by God, you cannot have two masters. If you're not being controlled by God, you're being controlled by the devil. It, and it sounds hard-hitting and harsh, but we need to understand the reality. We need to examine our attitudes. We need to see, are we in rebellion to God? Or are we actually really, truly seeking God and obeying Him? Okay, so we see here, the devil asks him this. Now, why? Why in the world would the devil actually use this temptation for Jesus. Why would he say to him, right, d- is, is Jesus the kind of guy who seems attracted to earthly glory? When you think of Jesus, you think, oh yeah, Jesus really wanted, th- that would be a temptation to him, earthly glory. That's, that's what Jesus wanted. Do you think that? No, right? You think Jesus was a humble man? He didn't want the glory for himself. Why would this be a temptation to Jesus? What was Jesus' mission? When he came to the earth, what was his mission for the earth? To save, to save people, right? Salvation. His mission was to come down and to redeem the earth, to take it back from the devil. And so we see here that the devil says to him, you know what? Have a look at all this. Have a look at this whole earth. You came here to redeem the earth. You want to redeem it? All you need to do, fall down and worship me and I will give the earth back to you and all the people that are in it. I'm the ruler of this world, but I'll allow you to be the ruler of this world. All you need to do is fall down and worship me. And the devil's true motives and intent comes out And this is his intent in all of our lives. All he wanted Jesus to do was to disobey what his father had asked him to do. And that's what the devil wants for us. If he can just get us to disobey God, we basically are worshiping him. And you may say to yourself, I would never worship the devil, right? I would never. My allegiance is to God. But your actions show, we know actions speak louder than words, and your actions show where your allegiance lies. And I'm not just saying this to you, this is for me as well. This is for me, you know, where, where is my allegiance? Who do I actually obey? Do I give in when the devil is in my ear telling me, and sometimes, you know, the devil will tell you as yourself, I don't need to forgive this person. I don't need to, I I just need to fight for myself right now. I need to talk back. I need to argue my point. I need to hit, hit home with this point. They're wrong. I'm right. I need to let them know. And that's the temptation, right? That's, that's my temptation anyway. I don't know what your temptation is, but that's my temptation. I know better. I need to let them see that I know better. But you know, one verse that is super powerful for me, it's a powerful promise. Exodus 14, 14 says, the Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. And there have been so many times when I need to claim that promise because honestly, the temptation for me is not to hold my peace, to just let them have it. In many of the close relationships in my life, it's to tell them what I think is right. And God says to me, You know what? You know the temptation that the devil is trying to put on you right now, and you have a choice. You can fall down and worship him, or you can hold to my promise. And my promise is that I will fight for you. And that's what that's what God says to each and every one of us. It may not apply, you may not have that specific temptation, but in every temptation, this is what Jesus says. In verse 10, it says. Then Jesus says to him, Get you from here, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only 
you shall serve. Now, again, this is quoting back in Deuteronomy chapter 6. This is quoting verses 13 to 15. It says, You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him and shall swear by his name. You shall not go after other gods of the gods of the people which are round about you. For the Lord your God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you and destroy you from off the face of the earth. When Christ quotes this scripture, he is saying to the devil, I will not participate in this idolatry that you're calling me to. And I don't know whether you have idols in your life, what or who that idol might be. But when we see Jesus actually claim this victory and resist the temptation, we see that truly, if he can resist this temptation, we can resist it too. We've, some of you are going through a wilderness experience right now. Some of you are saying, I'm not waiting for the wilderness experience to come. I'm not waiting for the tribulation or the persecution. I am going through the wilderness right now. I'm seeking after a mountaintop experience. I want to be with God, but this is the wilderness. There's a storm raging around me. And in that story I shared, Eight of those people didn't make it alive out of that wilderness experience. But there were many who did make it out alive. And most of all, when we look at Christ's wilderness experience, he made it out alive. And not only did he make it out alive, but God used that experience to strengthen him for the ultimate temptation. Turn with me to Luke. Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22 verses 41 to 44. It says here, this is in the garden of Gethsemane. It says, he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if you be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared an angel to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. This was another wilderness experience that Christ was going through. Leading up, in, in the events leading up to the cross, Christ suffered so greatly. And it wasn't just the drops of blood coming from his head. It was the emotional anguish of preparing to be separated from his father. It was the emotional anguish of, anguish of having your sins and my sins heaped upon him. It was that anguish that he was experiencing. And the devil knew, the devil knew the plan of salvation. The devil knew that this time would come. The devil knows he knows what's coming. And he knew that Christ would go through this. And when he offered that temptation to Christ, when he said, I can give you all of this, just bow down, fall down and worship me. What he was saying to Jesus was, if you don't, I'm going to torture you and I'm going to kill you. And you know what? There is coming a time for us as God's people, we, we see the signs. If you don't, please come and see me after. Talk to Uncle Lenny, Diamond. If you don't see the signs, just know that there are signs all around us. We see that there is coming a time when we may go through that same torturous experience, when we will be persecuted as God's people before us have been persecuted for our faith. When we will be persecuted for wanting to obey the commandments of God, to worship God on his holy Sabbath day, there, will, there is a wilderness experience coming for all of us. If you're not going through the wilderness now, praise the Lord. But there is a wilderness experience coming. And I don't say this to scare you. I say this to warn you so that you can be prepared. God wants us to be prepared. God wants our hearts to be ready. And when that wilderness experience comes, it may be a matter of 
being tortured, being killed. And are we, like Christ, going to say, you know what? I would rather be tortured than disobey God. I would rather sweat drops of blood and bear the sin of the world than disobey my Father in heaven who told me I am his beloved son. There is coming a day. This is what it says in Desire of Ages. If thou be the son of God, they said, come down from the cross. Satan with his angels in human form was present at the cross. Jesus, suffering and dying, heard every word as the priest declared. He saved others, himself he cannot save. Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. Christ could have come down from the cross, and that was the temptation. He could have come down from the cross, but it is because he would not save himself that the sinner has hope of favor and pardon with God. Praise the Lord. We have hope of favor and pardon because Christ resisted the temptation. He claimed victory in the wilderness, and as he went through his final wilderness experience, he claimed victory again. And this is the victory that we can claim when we are going through our wilderness experience, when we have no job and no one will give us a job, when we're being tempted to work on Sabbath, when we're being tempted with adulterous thoughts, when we're being tempted to disobey God and whatever he has put on our heart, whether it be in the area of health, finance, whatever it is, you have your own journey with God. The devil knew the price for Christ and the devil knows the price for you as well. And he is working hard, so hard to try and bring you down, to get you to disobey. But we have this beautiful example in Christ who could have come down and saved himself. But he said, I would rather die for those I love and obey my father in heaven. And all he asks us to do is follow his example. Let's finish with Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 5. Many of you know this. Many of you have committed this beautiful beautiful verse to memory. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 5. It says, He, Christ, was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. We're all seeking a mountaintop experience. We are all seeking the ultimate mountaintop experience to be with God one day in his heavenly city, to see him face to face and to enjoy his presence for, her, for eternity. That is the ultimate mountaintop experience. But as we seek the mountaintop experience, we will go through the wilderness and storms will hit us. And there are only two destinies that our decisions will lead us to. We'll either make it through alive or we won't. And God is telling us that Christ took upon himself our burdens, our chastisement. He took upon himself the stripes that we deserved so we could be healed. And it's not just for the end times, which are rapidly approaching. It's so that we can be healed even now, today, that you can walk through those doors and leave this building knowing that you are healed. My friend, Kemi, in Australia, she, she wrote this song called How? Question mark. And in the song, there are these beautiful words. How will I die for you if I cannot even live for you? How will I die for you if I cannot even live for you? It's, it's a powerful line. As we look towards the final events, as we look towards the, 
the, the events that Bible prophecy have already foreto- foretold and are unfolding all around us. We know the mark of the beast is not far away. It's not. And I'm not a time setter. I'm, I'm not saying exactly when it's going to come, but we know for sure it's not far. And the temptation is to give up the seal of God, to give up to not claim the promise that he will provide for us, that he will, he will send manna out of the sky for us. He will clothe us with his birds dropping garments for us. The, the temptation is to disobey God and just fix things on our own. But when we look at the cross, we see such power, such victory, and we see that by his stripes, We are healed. Let's claim his healing, his victory. And if that's something you want to do, you may be going through a wilderness experience. You may not be, but you want to say to God, I know that by your stripes, I am healed. And any wilderness experience I go to, I want to claim the victory that Christ offers me to get through that wilderness experience. If that is your prayer, please stand and let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we're so grateful to you, God, for just the way you have led us through so many wilderness experiences in the past. And Father, it's so easy for us to forget. It's so easy for us to forget your promises at the times we need them the most. And Father, we pray for your Holy Spirit to have to put your promises at the forefront of our minds in those moments when the devil comes to us, when he tempts us, because we know he will. Father, we, we pray that you will, you will give us the strength to claim those promises fully, not to be presumptuous, but to claim that to fulfill the conditions in obedience and to claim those promises in obedience. Father, we thank you for showing us an example in Christ that we can follow and we can know that he was given the ultimate tempt. He was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. Father, we know we are so sinful. We thank you, Father, that if we confess our sins, You are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And Father, we pray, if there are sins that are holding us back from you, Father, show us. Help us to search our lives, our attitudes. We don't want to be in rebellion to you. But Father, we don't want to just talk about it either. We want to obey you in our actions. We want obedience in our heart. Give us the heart of Christ, Father. And Father, we claim that promise that you gave us in Jude. Jude 1.24, you are able to keep us from stumbling. We claim that promise, Father, that we need not stumble. We need not give in to temptation. That as your Holy Spirit may lead us through a wilderness experience, that is an opportunity to be humbled, to prove our love and our allegiance to you and for you to know that we will keep your commandments, Father. We thank you. We pray for your blessing and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.